moving from Wall Street to Main Street to help small business owners have the same capital as corporate America and give them the same resources as a larger company. We cover business funding, business credit, scaling, business consulting, and much more. Check out the website at shieldadvisorygroup.com. Welcome to the show. The Liquid Lunch Project. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Liquid Lunch Project. I am Matthew R. Meehan, alongside my partner, the professor, Luigi Rosa Bianca. What's on tap today, Lou? Matt, there's nothing more challenging and more rewarding than a successful pivot. And today we have Dr. Angela Mulrooney, who went from successful dentist to the arsonist. Doc, I'm never going to do it justice. Explain to us what an arsonist does. So my role as an arsonist is I really hand people a match to look at what is not working in their life and strike the match and start burning it down. Um, so many people, when they're looking at making a pivot, they have all these hesitations because they're so attached to their life that was happening before and it's predictable. And so for them to pivot and go into a life that's unknown, it's scary, even if they know what they need to be doing and they know that they actually need to make this pivot to get to the happiness, to get to the success that they want. They often need that little push. And so my job is to hand them the match um, and get them to strike it so that they can start burning down what's holding them back. So, Doc, you've got a wonderful, thriving dental practice. You're making chiclets all over Calgary. What makes you become an arsonist? Unfortunately, yes, I was making chiclets all over Calgary, and life was really good with that practice. I had built a referral-based practice, and I had the perfect team, the perfect patients, the perfect skill set, and then I got injured. And overnight, I went from being able to drill to not being able to drill. So I ended up having to find a way to reinvent myself, find a way to contribute without a drill in my hand, because that's what I thought that was what my life was supposed to be since I was two years old. My course was to be a dentist. Well, Doc, let, let me, let's let's deep a little bit into this, because becoming a dentist is not easy. You go, you go to dental, dental school, you probably did a residency, you may have interned for someone, then you're building a practice. You've got a decades of probably a decade's worth of work product there. And then one day overnight, it's just, bam, disappears. Well, my life kind of went up in smoke. Suddenly everything that I'd built that, you know, I'd put in the right efforts, I had treated the patients well, I had treated my client, uh, my team well, and then everything just burned down around me, not because of anything I had done wrong. It was actually because of my genetics. And it was really hard to accept the fact that personally that I hadn't done something wrong. Like it took a long time for the doctors to actually convince me that I hadn't messed up. And then once I did accept that, it was like, well, what the heck am I supposed to do with my life? Because dentistry is like my love. It's my passion. It's what I live and breathe. And it was 100% my identity, which I hadn't realized until it wasn't my identity anymore. And then I had no idea who this little person sitting in the dark crying in the corner, um, who I was supposed to be or what I was supposed to actually do in this world. So it was, it was pretty tough. So now you have an office, you have staff, you probably have hundreds of thousands of dollars of equipment, what happens? Well, I took the advice of all the advisors around me because I had not been in this situation before. They had seen other people in this situation and they said, you know, you built a brand, you have a referral based practice, you know, people in the community trust you. So bring in some associates to do the work in your place. And that would have been a great idea if I had a very basic practice. The problem was I had acquired some massive skill sets. I was doing IV sedation. I was doing full mouth rehabilitation. I was doing implants. I was doing sleep apnea, which most dentists in their career, they might acquire one of those skills, but having those four skills was not, not usual. And that was part of the reason I had built the practice that I had. And most dentists don't wanna work with people who are afraid of the dentist because it's really high touch. You have to invest a lot of time in those patients. And so, yes, I could bring in associates, but they didn't want to handle those patients and most of them didn't have even one of those skills. So it was kind of a nightmare trying to, to fill my boots, unfortunately. And so I ended up having to dumb down the brand back to kind of what I had bought, which was a very basic practice for it to be able to survive and be able to keep dentists in the practice to serve the patient base. So Dr. Angela, walk us through your, your decision then, because... Oh, I don't know. You could have you could have sold uh, medical supplies. You could have gone to beauty school. I mean, of all the choices, how did you end up being um, the self improvement expert, aka the arsonist? Well, it it was not linear. 
<laughs> as we know, most success kind of goes in lots of different directions. And after I sold my dental practice, I actually opened my professional dance company because I danced professionally as long as I was a dentist. And I was like, you know what? I need a break from dentistry. I don't want to talk to dentists uh, because every time they talk to me, they're looking at me with pity because they feel bad for what I've gone through and they can't imagine going through that. So I took a step back, built Unleashed Dance Company. And in that year, I was like, you know, I have invested a lot of money in dentistry. This is where my heart is at. How can I take the silver lining from the crap that I've gone through and turn it into something beautiful? So I decided to build my business coaching company for dentists, which was called Unleashing Dentistry's Potential. And to get that company noticed, I took to LinkedIn, started talking about niching and passion um, and how to actually you know, build a brand around what you love in dentistry. And in a year, I went from 200 to 12,000 dental industry followers. And then suddenly people were like, how did you do that? And uh, can you try that on me? So I started to help a few of my friends and just took their profiles and just to see if I was uniform, if I had created something that was replicatable. And I had created something that was replicatable. So I decided to also, while running these two other companies, um, create Unleashing Influence, which became an official company um, January 20. 20. And exactly two months after I launched that company, Canada got shut down with the pandemic. And my team of two and a half employees were like, well, you know, the rest of the world's getting laid off. You can lay us off too. And I said, mm, let's buckle down and just see what we can do. And by 10 months into the pandemic, I had 14 full-time team members. We had exploded. My dance company and my dental company had kind of imploded because those two things were shut down as far as dentists being able to work, as far as dance companies being able to operate, because in Canada, we were very strict about what we could do to interact in person. And so I got lucky and bet on the right pony and allowed that to take off. And then I moved to Nicaragua in January of 2021 and realized I had built a monster that I did not like because um, I'm sitting in paradise, working 100 hours a week going, I'm not even seeing paradise. I might as well be back in a snowbank in Calgary. I'm not even going to call that a pivot because at this point, your life is standing on a bull bearing. You, you really have fluid movement with your profession, with your geography. Teach us how to develop that mindset. How can we be so open-minded where we could just pick up and move countries, cultures, jobs, there's, there, there is a secret sauce in there somewhere. It really has to do with trusting your intuition. What happened with my dental practice was I had these outside advisors telling me, you should do this, you should do that, you should do this and the other thing. And that whole time I was suppressing my intuition, which was every time I come into my practice, I feel pain because it hurts so much to see that I can't do the dentistry. And once I actually let that go and start to just trust myself, that's where these these opportunities started to open up. And let's be honest, after I lost my dental practice, I was searching to figure out who I was supposed to be, how I could contribute. And so that's where the different brands came from. But that shift in country and being in a hot place and being like a fish out of water made me uncomfortable enough to say, things have to change. I can't work 100 hours a week. I can't run all these, these businesses. I need to pick a pony and bet on it and run with it. And so that was when I started to be able to go, okay, let's get rid of that. Let's get rid of that. And I just started simplifying my life as much as possible down to exactly what I do best, which is the personal branding through LinkedIn. And so it was trusting my instinct and going, you know, this doesn't feel right. Let's light the match, burn that down. This one over here ugh, still kind of makes me feel sick when I think about that. Light the match, burn it down. And so what I did was just burn things down to the essence of what I do best. And that is hard for people because we always have these external advisors saying, you should, you should, you should, and people should all over us. And it's easy to go, okay, well, they probably know better than me because I've never done this before. But that little inner voice, that intuition that nags at you, that says, you know, ugh, I get that gut feeling that it's good or it's bad. If we can actually trust that, the opportunities are usually in that place where the gut feels good. Doc, do you think you were your first crime of arson? Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. Okay, so, so Matt and I have this inside joke, right? So whether it's doctors, engineers, architects, lawyers, when you spend so much time developing a niche expertise, you're master of a very, very finite universe. But as a result, you become a moron with the rest of the universe. <laughs> it's very true. So walk us through a typical day in the life of Dr. Angela Mulrooney, the arsonist, in helping one of your clients promote their LinkedIn 
um, marketplace. So the beauty of having niche into what I'm doing is I have that depth of knowledge. And so it allows me to go deeper and deeper into the personal branding. So when I work with people, I actually work with them in 90 day masterminds. So I have a collective of people who are looking to either come from corporate and take the years of experience that they've developed and create their legacy, or I have people who are trying to develop their brand to represent their corporation. And what I'm doing in those 90 days with them is we're working on how to transform their credibility through LinkedIn. So I use brand archetypes. I help them to, you know, I actually write their about section on their LinkedIn to tell their story. And then how do we thread that through everything that they're doing? So there's that congruency. And then we work into how do you actually craft your limelight? So how do you get the right people seeing you? So how do we build a system to actually hunt the right audience members? And how do we build a system to actually follow those audience members, shake them down in the funnel to become the right people? And then how do we get them onto a phone call? So we're building the business behind that and then also the offer. So I'm working with people in those 90 days holding their hand to get them through that pivot and have a business built by the end of it, not just, oh, here's your personal brand and hope you make some money out of it. It's build your personal brand and build everything that is actually going to help you to make the money so that you aren't coming out of that nine days going, well, I hope this works. You already have something that is tested and, and true and is working really well for you. So doc, those are broad strokes, right? We, we really like to get more into like details for the audience so they could have a takeaway of what they need. So get the point, write the bio on LinkedIn, grab somebody's attention, but how do you attract their attention? What should they be posting? What are a couple tips that somebody can take away from this podcast right now and go and implement? So figure out what your niche is and talk about that. So usually what I tell people is, okay, here's your niche. And then if you could only talk about three things in your niche, what are those three things that you would talk about for the next five years that you'd be happy to do? And that's usually where you find your joy in the work that you're doing. And that's actually where your mastery is going to lie. And then when you're creating content, make sure it fits under those three categories and points to that niche. Everything that you're doing, whether it's a personal post, whether it is content, and with your content, the best thing you can do is short and sweet. Pick one thing to talk about. Don't be like, here's the top 10 list of things to do that no one is ever going to remember. Ask a question and answer it in a 30 to 60 second video that is going to give someone something to munch on and give them something executable. Because the way that people used to do things is they have this little carrot and be like, oh, maybe if you buy from me, I'll actually tell you what the carrot is and let you have a bite of it. Instead, give them the carrot. No one is going to be able to put your whole program together by watching 30 to 60 second videos, right? So yes, you're giving your knowledge away, but you don't have to be afraid that someone's going to copy it, that someone is going to know exactly what you're doing because they'd have to really sit down and try and put the puzzle pieces together and figure out how you think about things and how your expertise and your experience fits into this. So the biggest thing is really be generous with your knowledge. Share as much as you can, share as generous as you can, share as deeply as you can, because that gives people the ability to go, oh, this person knows what they're talking about. I can trust them. I like what they're saying. I actually want to have a discussion with them. So that is my best takeaway that I can give you. No, I love that. Givers definitely gain, right? We give out so much free advice, content, education, right? And I feel like the more people that you give it out to, they don't go and do it themselves. They just come back to you and say, hey, I want to hire you. Can you do this for me? Can you help me out here? And we'd be happy to. How did you hear about us? Well, I watched the video. I heard a podcast, right? I read your blog. I saw your feature in Forbes, right? Your story actually translates a lot and relates a lot to my personal story, right? So I was on Wall Street for seven to, uh, 16 years. And one day I woke up and found that I wasn't happy, right? I didn't get hurt like you, but I just wasn't happy. My wife wasn't happy. Thriving firm, right? We went from five to over 80 registered reps. I didn't move to Nicaragua, but I moved to Florida, right? And I kind of burnt everything down, which felt good. But then I, there, there was a little part of me that was lost because I didn't know what my identity was. And my identity was my work, which it should never have been, which I found out after, you know, going through some uh, deep, deep insight personally. And it is hard for most professionals. If they were dedicated to becoming the professional that they were, your identity is so intertwined. And so if something happens where you lose it or you choose to leave it, then that unraveling of those two things is one of the hardest things. And it's a lot of times it will stop people from actually making the pivot 
is because they don't want to lose that identity that they're so comfortable in. So I totally get what you're saying. So what are some things that you help somebody who's struggling with that right now? Maybe they just got laid off. Maybe their business just went under and their identity is tied to what they were doing, not who they were or are. Yeah. So it really depends on the person. If you're really passionate about your work, your work and your identity are going to be intertwined. I'm still very intertwined with my work, right? So personal branding is part of my identity and dance was part of my identity. Dentistry was part of my identity. And so for those people who are really passionate, we just have to find a new way to keep that identity, but do it in a new way that is actually going to get them to where they want to go. Um, Again, most people who are passionate, you're not going to actually be able to separate those two things. It's good to have hobbies outside, but if you are trying to make a difference and the people I tend to work with are people are trying to change the world with what they know. And so that passion and that, um, that motivation that they have in the world to actually do that is inherent in them. You can't pull that out of them. Even if they lose their job, they're still going to have that identity that they need to make a difference in this world. Hey, Dr. Angela, do you find that there's a correlation with the change of retirement with professionals? You know, someone that's been in a career for 30, 35, 40 years, and then all of a sudden um, is a babysitting grandparent? So I'm finding uh, actually a lot of people that I'm attracting, they have 30 plus years, sometimes 40 years of experience in their industry and they're not done. They have this mission. They want to step out of corporate, get out of that CIO, CEO position in a company and actually create a legacy in a new way. And so they're looking to find a way to work better, work um, more efficiently to replace that income while creating that legacy in the world. And so I'm not seeing people being like, oh, I'm going to retire at 60. It's like at 60, let's get going. Let's create this new thing. I'm the next 10 years, I actually want to create something that is going to leave an impact on the world and take the experience that I've had and actually make a difference in people's lives. So there's definitely, a, there is a massive mindset change from, you know, we hit the 60 button and we're out. And now it's like, no, I'm hitting the 60 button. Now I can change things. I've got enough money saved that I can actually go into this passion project. But I also, you know, they want to gamify it. They want to be able to keep score and actually still make a really good income from it. So I have a question. LinkedIn's had a lot of changes recently. And all I keep hearing about is LinkedIn, LinkedIn, LinkedIn. Facebook used to be huge. Instagram still big for, I guess it depends on what demographic that you're in. But why LinkedIn? LinkedIn, if you are a professional going after professionals, that's where you need to be. If you're a professional going after mommies and daddies, it's not where you need to be, right? So it depends on who your audience is. But LinkedIn has changed from what people still kind of associate as a job platform. You know, you, your boat section is your skill set and your resume. And it's not that anymore. It really is one of the best personal branding platforms if you're a professional going after professionals. So the ability to actually put your thought leadership out there in a way that is going to hit the right people who are looking for that information. People who are on LinkedIn, if they're using it not as a job platform, if they're looking at it as a business building platform or a networking platform, they're looking for that great information that they can take and use in their career or use in their business or use to help themselves. So they're not looking for that fluff. They're looking for that nitty gritty, you know, those 30 to second. 30 to 60 second videos where they can give them information, grab it, use it for themselves. And then if they get stuck, they're going to come back to the person who created that video. You know, we don't use LinkedIn that much for marketing, but I'm definitely think we should because anytime somebody I know puts something on um, LinkedIn, I get an email notification, right? It's got right. some really yeah. great features. What are some features that you like to use with your clients from LinkedIn? One of the best ones that is underutilized is newsletters. So the newsletters will give a notification to people who are registered to follow your newsletter that you've posted something new. And I have, I think I have 23,000 followers on LinkedIn. Every newsletter I post within 24 hours has 2,500 views consistently over and over and over again. So it is one of the best, like of all the content I put out there, my newsletter is guaranteed to get that engagement and get those reads. And yes, you have to write stuff, which a lot of people are not really comfortable writing. But if you're already producing other content, transcribe it, turn it into an article, something that you already did as a video, take what you spoke and turn it into something that is 
readable because sometimes what we spoke and then you read it afterwards, you're like, that makes no sense at all. Um, but you can take that and be able to get that boost in your engagement in a format without having to do a whole bunch of work. And they don't have to be long articles. Like my articles are usually one to three minute reads and LinkedIn will actually time it based on the number of words and put that at the bottom so people can see, okay, this is how much time I'm going to have to invest in reading this. But it is really highly prioritized by the algorithm to be put in front of the right people. So LinkedIn, every time I turn it on, I'm getting messages and inbox messages and spam and spam galore, right? And it's, it's all these bots in there too. So how do you get the meeting with somebody after they've been attracted to you? You know, you probably, they probably commented on your post. You, you got a little banter going back and forth. How do you stay away mm -hmm. and not become one of those spammers that just say, hey, I got an opportunity for you? So a lot of people, they'll either do content or they'll do messages. And oftentimes when people are doing messages, they are just like hitting people over the head with a pitch, which when you know, don't even know someone, why are you pitching them? You know, someone is like, oh, you need UX development for your website and we're the best people for it. And I'm like, how do I know if I even need UX development? Luckily, I know what that actually is. But if they're <laughs> sending that to a whole bunch of people. I'm so curious about foreign exchanges lately. I don't know why. <laughs> I know it's crazy and they're just making their they're profiling who they think will buy from them but they're not even looking at their profiles and going oh, okay this person is actually interested in this they're just throwing out that pitch and what I suggest is have the content lane have the the messaging lane but talk like a human being you know if you're meeting someone for the first time you're not like hey I'm Angela the arsonist I can fix your personal branding your LinkedIn sucks come talk to me no I'm gonna say hey, how's everything going? It's a very simple question. And you'll be shocked at how many people will actually respond with a significant length and thoughtfulness of answer as to how everything is going in their world. And if you start to have that little bit of banter back and forth, maybe you have something that you want to introduce them to, like I have the Unleashing Influence community. So if someone is interested in working on their personal brand, I invite them to the community. And then they're getting really good content in there that is just related to their community, related to building their personal brand. And then if they like that, they're invited to a discovery call. So you have to start with personal, kind of shake out who is actually a good fit because you don't want to try to talk to everyone. And we're seeing, this is another thing we're seeing, not just getting pitched, but people from oftentimes MLM companies are like, hey, we should get on a phone call in the first message. And I'm like, I don't know you. Why would I get on a phone call with you when my time is precious and your time is as precious? Um, and so they're really like, they're trying to get married before they even date. And so you kind of have that little banter back and forth, you know, you flirt a little bit, then you actually get on the date and then you get, get them in and see if you actually want to do business with them. But um, people are impatient. And so they're trying to really get, get to the marriage part, getting to the sales part as fast as they possibly can. And it's really off-putting. So I got another very important question for you. How was the move from Canada to Nicaragua? What are the differences? It's really hot here. <laughs> First place I lived in, um, the office would be like 35 degrees by two o'clock in the afternoon. I'd be like, I can't even think straight in here anymore. Um, so that was an adjustment. Definitely language is an adjustment, but the most beautiful part of being here actually is the simplicity of life. You have everything that you need and you have nothing more. You can ship stuff in through Amazon and it comes by boat from Miami over to Nicaragua and then you get you have to go and pick it up. But for the most part, like everything that you need is here. After work, you can go and sit on a beach and watch the beautiful sunset. You can go surfing, hop in the ocean, you can go fishing. There's all these things to do that are the simple things in life. You don't have the complication of traffic. You don't have the complication of, oh, I have fear of missing out because there isn't hundred things going on every night like you would have in a big city and so that's what I appreciate most about here is it has simplified my life it's allowed me to get really concentrated in my business so I work these hours and then I go and play how'd you choose Nicaragua do we throw uh, a dart on a map and end up there or is there a story behind it uh, well originally I was planning to go and do international business development to Australia and South Africa and all these lovely places and every time I made that choice this was a little bit into the pandemic Canada would have a spike in numbers and the border would be closed to Canadian and so I was like okay okay universe I get it you don't want me to go that place so I still put my house up on the market sold it and then I happened to meet someone who was coming down here so I came down and decided I was going to come visit for a couple of weeks and then five days into arriving, Canada bought out all the tropical flights so that 
we weren't having um, people coming back and forth during the pandemic and bringing COVID back to Canada. So I got stuck here uh, for the next four months and then decided I liked it and continued to stay. Or you could say the Canadians got stuck north of the border. So how's how's your Spanish, Dr. Angela? Kind of shitty. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. It's really not good, my my French is good, um, which actually is really terrible with Spanish because people say things to me and I want to respond in French. Um, but I am starting to pick up a few things. Honestly, the first year that I was here, I was so busy with all the companies that I just was done at the end of the day and didn't have the time to invest in it. But that is definitely this last quarter of the year. Part of my focus is getting my Spanish under control so that I don't feel like a moron every time someone speaks to me. Now, are those roots taking heed? Are they? Are you watering them? You, are you there to stay? I haven't decided. For now, this is where I think I want to be. And if an opportunity opens up to be somewhere else, my company is completely portable and that was deliberately created that way so that as long as I have an internet connection, I can do the work that I need to do. I think that's a beautiful way to be able to exist because, you know, especially these days, you don't know what's going to come at you where you actually need to make a big shift. And geographically, that can be a problem if your company is brick and mortar. Dr. Angel, we've seen a lot of Americans over the last decade or so um, go into Costa Rica in their retirement years. You know, low cost of living, stable political environment, nice climate. Um, describe to us what you see in Nicaragua. Similar? So, yes. Um, the country is actually very similar because we actually share a border. But Nicaragua tends to, there's a lot of young families here, actually. There is a really good international school here, so people are comfortable bringing their kids and having them get an education in a different country because it's run by, um, I think it's now four Americans and two Canadians. And so they have the ability to come down here and have a, they're really trying to introduce them to a simpler way of life. Some of them are trying to escape politics and COVID and all that kind of stuff. But a lot of them are just looking at life and going, you know, things are so complicated in North America. We don't want our kids existing in that. We want them in a place where they're going to be in nature during the day, during their school day. They're going to get that education. They're going to see that life doesn't have to be this rat race that we have subscribed to. in North. America. So, Doc, you've done so many things. You've had a, a lot of different lives so far, right? Yeah. Where do you see yourself going next? What's version 7.0 look like? I love this question and I hate this question because really the goal that's next year is just to stay in this lane that I have chosen and just go deep with it um, and drive it as far as I possibly can because I've spent a lot of time, you know, going after the next thing and changing and pivoting and I'm kind of tired of the chaos of that and I just want to create the simplicity, get the mastery in this. Um, and change as many lives as I possibly can with people's personal brands. And that really is the 100% focus for the next 12 months, hopefully for the next five years, actually. And, uh, you know, just stay narrow and and deep with what I'm doing. Dr. Angela, thank you so much for being here. We want to be respectful of your time. You're doing amazing things. You're helping people build so many great personal brands. Um, can you tell everybody where they can find you and how they can get in touch with you? Yes. So LinkedIn is the best place to find me. So you can find Dr. Angela Mulroney. If you want to join the community, it's called the Unleashing Influence Community. And then, of course, there's my website, unleashinginfluence.com. Doc, thanks so much. This episode was a my blast. Pleasure. Before I let you run, though, describe yourself in one word for the audience. <laughs> it's mean. Um, mean? <laughs> I think it's mean. One word? Oh, my gosh. Oh, you Passionate. think that's mean? I thought, I thought mean was the word. <laughs> I would say passionate is probably the best word for me. Vamos! <laughs> passionate it is. Dr. Angela, thanks so much for joining us. Guys, that's a wrap of the Liquid Launch Project. If you want more from us, go to www.theliquidlaunchproject.com and you can get join our daily newsletter. Thank you. Dr. Said, you gotta good. stick to LinkedIn. Thank you for listening to the show. And make sure you subscribe, leave a review, and share it with a friend. We'll see you on the next episode of The Liquid Lunch Project.